from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day, the changing face of the dairy industry. I would say the next four to five years, we're going to see huge, huge changes. Um, probably changes we haven't seen in over a thousand years. See what may drive the dairy farm of the future. A new push to get USMCA done before the end of the year. As an apparent olive branch is extended in the trade war with China. I call it good mood music, yeah. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado and the all new Silverado HD. The strongest, most advanced family of Silverados ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Soybean futures making gains to end last week after China's finance ministry announced Beijing is waiving some tariff hikes on U.S. soybeans and pork while the two sides continue to negotiate a trade deal. China originally promising in September to lift the tariffs, but no details were released. Now the finance ministry saying Beijing is carrying out the exclusion but giving no details. The action is being seen as a goodwill gesture by China. Exemptions for pork are likely to be in higher demand since there are less than two months until China's Lunar New Year holiday, which is the country's peak consumption period. White House Economic Advisor Larry Kudlow weighing in. We're going to just take that day at a time. Uh, talks around the clock right now. Uh, we are close. We're not quite there yet. The president has characterized these talks as constructive. And I don't want to make any forecasts about any dates. There's no arbitrary deadlines, never has been. Any, Larry, the Chinese are saying that they're going to implement some tariff waivers. I saw that On uh, soybeans yeah. and pork. Should we take that as a, an encouraging yeah. signal from yeah. Beijing? Yeah, I call it good mood music. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. President Trump continuing to say talks with China are moving along well. The question remains whether President Trump will impose additional tariffs scheduled to go into effect December 15th. Well, we'll have to see, but right now we're moving along. We're not discussing that, but we are having very major discussions. On December 15th, uh, something could happen, but we are not discussing that yet. We're having very good discussions with China, however. The U.S. Meat Export Federation is reporting strong demand from China helped U.S. pork exports in October. It reports exports increased 8.5% year over year and export value climbed 10% to $592 million. And there's more upbeat talk when it comes to the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi saying the agreement will be passed by Congress when, quote, we have the language with enforcement in it, end quote. Pelosi telling CNN she's optimistic the deal will get done before Congress leaves for holiday recess later this month. You'll remember earlier this month, Pelosi stated it may not get done until next year. Republican members of the Texas congressional delegation holding a news conference pushing for passage. We have worked together as a delegation to create bipartisan support for this agreement and to pass it uh, out of the House and Congress this year. Every former uh, Secretary of Ag has, uh, has agreed, has signed on to uh, getting this done. Every Republican, Democrat, uh, every Republican go uh, governor uh, in our country has said get this done. We've had over a thousand trade organizations directly related to agriculture have said get this deal done. So agriculture gets a big win if we were to get uh, USMCA done uh, and done quickly. With the backing of labor unions, Pelosi has insisted on changes that ensure improved labor and environmental standards are enforced. Changes to the waters of the U.S. rule are now at the White House. The EPA sending the final rule over for review. The EPA publishing the proposed rule in February, now saying the final rule was developed after reviewing public comments on the proposal. The Trump administration saying removal of the old rule would provide regulatory certainty for farmers and landowners. Now, under the proposal, traditional navigable waterways will remain federally regulated, but tributaries, ditches, lakes, ponds, and wetlands will only be federally regulated if they pour into a traditional navigable waterway in a typical year. The new WOTUS rule specifically excludes groundwater, prior converted cropland, water control features, and fields like cranberry bogs flooded for harvest. The agency is now targeting January to release that final rule. Some interesting new numbers when it comes to beef production here in the U.S. over the last 50 years. USDA researchers saying production has increased by 25 percent. That's even while the number of cattle for beef has decreased by 6 percent. Researchers creating this graphic showing beef production in blue, numbers of cattle in orange, 
and the average weights in gray. And you can see the trend. The decline in the number of cattle has been more than countered by an increase in cattle weights. That increase, more than 30%. Now, experts say changes in breeding practices have produced heifers and steers with higher growth rates and higher feed conversion efficiencies in pastures and feedlots. And with that in mind, USDA is forecasting beef production to reach record levels this year and next year. Continuing our look at the dairy industry and the changes being made to try and bring more people back to the dairy aisle, Farm Journal's Tyne Morgan shows us the changes that are taking place right in the milking parlor. As consumers' tastes change, so is the world of dairy. I would say the next four to five years we're going to see huge, huge changes. Um, probably changes we haven't seen in over a thousand years. Aiden Connolly runs an artificial intelligence business focusing on dairy cows. We actually don't really know entirely when we should inseminate a cow. We often inseminate three times to get it right one time. All of those things could make us much more accurate and could make us much more sustainable, and I hope also make us a little bit more profitable. He says dairy producers have to learn how to better manage their cows. To answer the questions that consumers, I, I love the word prosumers, that prosumers, proactive consumers are looking for us to answer, to explain how we treat our animals, how we produce our, our food sustainably, what our carbon footprint is and all of that stuff, but above all else, to make sure we're doing so at the right, in the right way at the right price. Tim Taylor is an executive who focuses on technology, helping the industry transform. So I, I think with uh, digital transformation, you either are a victim of it, like technology roadkill, or you embrace it and you become self-disruptive, which is transformative. And I think that not only dairies, need to adopt technology in a collaborative sense, but the industry needs to adopt collaboration through technology in order to get more efficient and more factful so that it can reach downstream to consumers. He says customers are curious how dairy farms are driving quality and transparency on the farm. The consumer wants to know, where's my product coming from? How was it made? What are the quality metrics? And they want to see it in transparency. So this transparency movement driven by both sustainability and the power of the consumer through social media is the biggest trend in the dairy industry. Connolly says if dairies don't embrace the change, they will become the taxis in a world of Uber or a movie store trying to fight Netflix. We're in a tremendous era of disruption and to imagine food business will not be disrupted in the same way as every other business is very naive. But if you don't think differently, you will be disrupted. The business will be transformed and you probably will be like the dinosaurs going out of business. Disruptions that will drive change as the dairy landscape continues to shake up. We hope you enjoyed the warmer temperatures over the weekend because that very cold air Mike told you about last week is now starting to dip down out of Canada. Meteorologist Mike Hoffman joins us with an update. Mike. Yeah, that's right, Clinton. We're already seeing the jet stream dipping into the northern plains and that's bringing a direct shot of Arctic air into the northern parts of the country. And that's going to be about a two or three day affair in most areas. It's also beginning to look and feel more like Christmas. Lance Hoffman in Salina, Kansas, showing off his Christmas lighting skills, saying in his Twitter post, quote, I'm just hoping I made Clark Griswold proud. Certainly a lot of lights there and the Grinch in the driver's seat is a nice touch. I'll have more on your forecast coming up in just a little while. It's hard to believe we're already nearing the end of the year and today's analysis we help you plan your end game. And later, KFC's own unique way of tempting your taste buds. And all you have to do is sit back and breathe easy. Bayer has agreed to postpone two upcoming U.S. trials involving its Roundup weed killer to allow more time for mediation talks that could lead to a possible settlement. Bloomberg reporting the two trials were scheduled to start next month in California. Other Roundup trials are still scheduled to begin next month. Bayer has lost three U.S. trials against plaintiffs who claim Roundup caused their cancer. However, Bayer is still appealing those verdicts and continuing to insist the product is safe. As of October, there were more than 42,000 plaintiffs suing the company over the product. A strong U.S. jobs report and the waiving of some tariffs on soybeans and pork by China helped fuel some gains to end last week. Let's see where we're starting things off this week from the CME. 
today in the grain market, soybeans were firm. The traders are waiting for news on any kind of a trade deal. Just any headline at all is really what they're hoping for. So the market has really traded on both sides of unchanged, and maybe now it's just a little bit easier, though. Even if a deal does come, though, South American weather has improved and will definitely put a lid on any kind of significant rally. Uh, that being said, the market looks relatively strong uh, right now. Uh, traders are just like rolling their December positions into the 2020 contract. And the holiday is kind of like stalled the markets from any kind of rally right now. Trade deal news is still really the focus here. But let's not uh, not forget that there's that big storm out there. And uh, if the storm is here to stay, it could be very difficult to get the rest of the harvest in for corn and soybeans. And it will be springtime before we get that in. Have an end game for this year. Farm Journal Stein Morgan helps you find one in today's analysis. Here now with Matt Bennett of agmarket.net. Matt, as we close out 2019, looking at 2020, you know, what should a producer's game plan be at this point when there is so much question mark still about 2019? Well, I think the first thing a producer has to do is they've got to sit down and figure out, uh, considering fertilizer prices, you know, what is my break even? And, and the reason why I say fertilizer prices, potash is kind of steady on the year, uh, phosphorus is down a little bit, nitrogen uh, basically down across the board. Now, it's not down a ton, but the bottom line is this, the amount of corn that you need to sell to pay for your fertilizer is less right now than what it was a year ago. And that's a really good thing. So I want to figure out what is my break even, first of all, and then start my marketing plan. Uh, you've got to understand that the carryout levels could look drastically different than what they look right now if we end up planting a lot of acres. And we know there's a lot of prevent plant acres coming back into both corn and beans, most likely for 2020. You know, this year I talked to several producers, especially in the June time frame that said, you know, we had a plan and it went out the window quickly. And then we went from plan B to C to D to E. I mean, it changed daily. Do you think that burns some producers this year? Well, I think it burns producers, but the thing is that, that we've always said is that, you know, if your first sale is your worst sale and it's profitable, it's going to be a pretty darn good year. And so I like to sell in increments at profitable levels. And so uh, right now I'm going to put together uh, my break even with a yield that's believable and it's fairly conservative because I don't want to get too overzealous here. Uh, and if I do that and I'm still able to make money at that particular situation, I might be able to beat the budget later on. And so I, I want to make conservative sales at profitable levels. MFP this year, MFP last year. I'm hearing a lot of bankers telling their, their clients, don't bank on MFP for 2020 either. You know, how does that come into play as well? MFP has uh, allowed producers the ability to not market for a while uh, this year, okay? But looking ahead to next year, I would say if it was not an election year, I would 100% agree. But I do think there is a, probably a pretty good likelihood, unless we see some major trade deals, that you're going to see some sort of government assistance this next year. Uh, because if it doesn't come from the president, it's probably going to come from the people that would like to become president. And, and one of the two groups is going to push to get the farmers some money to try to buy that vote. We need to put up disclaimer. We are not saying MFP is a for sure thing in 2020, right? I'm not, that. but I think but that it's... the election year, you're saying the You can't rule it out. Okay. Matt, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Let's take a quick break and then we'll have much more right here on Ag Day. To contact Matt Bennett at Ag Market, call 844-4-AG-MARKET or visit their website at www.agmarket.net. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. Meteorologist Mike Hoffman taking a look at rainfall of the past week. And Mike, if we look out in California, that's where we probably saw the biggest rain. Yeah, you really did. It was a small pocket, as you can see right there, but uh, it definitely hit the valley and the Sierra Nevadas with some heavy snow. Now, I want to clarify, obviously in the valley, it was all rain out there but uh yeah that was a lot of melt melted snow well that's what the snow would melt down to in the sierra nevadas is what we're kind of looking at there now the other pockets of moisture uh, nothing ultra heavy here but we did see some areas of a couple of inches and in parts of uh, northern mississippi northern alabama tennessee valley ohio valley Farther northwest then, uh, the northern uh, portions of Michigan, especially the UP, back into northern Wisconsin, northeastern Minnesota, saw some decent amounts, and also central and eastern New York into uh, New England. Now, a lot of this fell as snow, 
and is now melting, but it was a lot of snow. I mean, Albany got almost uh, two feet of snow officially out of that storm system. Root zone moisture is still showing the wet uh, situation across the northern tier of the Corn Belt into the Great Lakes, even down into uh, the central Mississippi Valley, parts of the Ohio and Tennessee Valley. Dryness in the mid-Atlantic, especially southern Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, some in the southwest, but really the worst is in the northwest. Just haven't been getting any big storm systems coming in off the Pacific lately. Drought monitor continues to show pockets of dryness in Texas and the southeast, but the big area is in the Four Corner region. Now here comes the cold and you can see a uh, big uh, vortex sitting over Hudson Bay will uh, bring these shots of cold air in. Then it backs off a little bit. Then another shot coming Friday, Saturday, Sunday and on into Monday. And then we go kind of zonal, which would be an interesting situation. Be very cold up here, very warm down here and that would mean some storms in between. So temperatures this week obviously below normal in most areas east of the continental divide except for South Florida, above normal in the northwest, above normal precipitation in the northwest for a change, and then from eastern Texas up the eastern seaboard above normal precipitation this week as well. This goes to that zonal flow that I was uh, showing you basically 30 day outlook below normal northern tier of states above normal in the southeast and south central uh, plain states, 30 day outlook for precipitation below normal up and down the plains into the Pacific Northwest, above normal four corner region, and also in the eastern seaboard, as you can see, most areas above normal. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. Heading to Denver, Colorado, first of all, colder with clouds and some sunshine, high of 34 degrees. Houston, Texas, a mix of sunshine and clouds, high around 80. And Cleveland, Ohio, breezy and mild with showers, high of 52 degrees today. Coming up, Machinery Pete is seeing a trend. Farm land values, I gotta tell you folks, I'm seeing kind of the same trend I've been seeing with used farm machinery. Stick around, we'll talk about it. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. What do farmland values have to do with used farm equipment? Well, Machinery Repeat says he's seeing a trend. I gotta tell you folks, I'm kind of seeing the same trend with farm land values that I've been seeing the past couple years with used farm machinery. Basically, if it's a good piece of equipment in good condition or a good piece of ground, uh, the buyer demand is strong, the dollars are there. Now, conversely, if it's average condition, not the right piece of ground, uh, values are sliding. Now, here's an example. Here's a piece of ground just under 70 acres that sold last week of November up in northwest Iowa. My friends at Zomer Auctioneering, 16,800 bucks an acre. Now, this was Sioux County, Iowa, and that's high test ground, but still 16,800 bucks an acre, nothing to sneeze at. Now, the same auction company, Zomer Auctioneering, had a, a farm machinery auction the next week, December 3rd in northwest Iowa, where this really sharp 2002 Case Edge MX220 3,700 hours on it, sold for $60,000. Now that's the highest auction price I've seen on an MX220 in five years. Now if we kind of stay with this theme of 15 to 20 year old, kind of around 200 horse tractors, the very next day, December 4th in central Illinois on a farm auction, this uh, really clean 2005 KSH MX210, 3,041 hours on it, sold for $57,250 second highest auction price this year on an MX210. And back on November 25th, farm auction in North Central Iowa, this really clean John Deere 8220, it was a 2005 model, only had 1,368 hours on it. So for 117,000 bucks, folks, that's the highest auction price on 8220 in six and a half years. All right, thanks, Pete. There may be nothing better on a cold day than curling up on the couch in front of the fireplace. And one fast food company has an unusual option for you. Details next. Ag Day, brought to you by the Enlist Weed Control System. More weed control, less drift and volatility, maximum yield potential. Do you love the smell of fried chicken? How would you like to smell that throughout your house? Leave it to the folks over at Kentucky Fried Chicken to come up with this. It's selling a chicken scented fire log. Yes, it's the real deal. The so-called 11 herbs and spices fire log is on sale, but only at walmart.com for $18.99. KFC saying in a news release, quote, enjoy the delicious taste, smell and warmth 
of Colonel Sanders fried chicken in complete never leave the couch bliss. The company is selling it for the first time last year, but it's sold out in just three hours. Since then, KFC says it has gotten calls every week from hopeful fans wanting to get their hands on this unique gift they say is great for the office secret Santa or white elephant gift exchange. Ah, oh, can't you just smell it now? That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.